Hey, this is Cam with the Flat Avalanche Center. Uh, a few nights ago, we did the State of the Snowpack talk and just figured I'd re-record it and uh, and shoot it out there because we do have a pretty interesting snowpack. We're making a transition into spring-like weather. Um, so, yeah, here we go. Uh, since the last day of the snowpack, we went through a really impressive avalanche cycle um, in end of, end of February. And, you know, this photograph is uh, pick, taken after that. This is in the Flathead Range, and that's where the big bulk of the avalanche activity occurred. But we'll kind of talk about what what happened, um, what's what things are looking like right now, and then just get a quick idea of of maybe what will happen in the future. Um, so, kind of big picture, I thought this was pretty interesting to look at. Um, this kind of this is a uh, a screenshot from the NRCS website, and this is looking at uh, snow water equivalent. Uh, year to date and the dots in blue are areas that are 100 percentile and dots in green are generally shown like pretty much average at 75 percentile um but year to date they're you know that those green dots are are mostly average um or just above and then red dots are below average so if we look at just the big picture a lot of the precipitation is hit in california nevada utah colorado so I guess, you know, bottom line is you got spring spring ski plans. Maybe the Sierra is the, the year for that. But as we move further north, we are seeing <clears throat> fairly average year-to-date precip in Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming, and get further north into our neck of the woods. Um, some of our areas are sitting average or just above, and, and the further north we go, it's um, we're seeing less precipitation year-to-date or water. So... Uh, the overarching theme is the the further north you go, the shallower the snowpack generally is. So looking at uh, the micro scale, looking at just our forecast region, looking at the whitefish range and uh, even in the northern flathead and parts of Glacier National Park outside of our forecast area, we're sitting at a thin snowpack and haven't gotten a lot of water year to date. And you go further south into the Swan and, and missions outside of our forecast areas, we're, we're, we've got a lot healthier snowpack. It's deeper. We've gotten more precip. And it's funny, through um, January and February, the Swan would routinely pick up, it seemed like a foot of snow every um, once a week. And it just would completely miss the other forecast parts of our forecast area. So what this translates is, yeah, the you know, in, in the big picture, just looking at these graphs is that the Swan's got a, a deeper, better snowpack. And then other parts of our forecast area is just shallower and a little bit more rotten. So for this, we'll just break each one, um, break it apart into our three forecast areas because they, they vary quite a bit. So the, the whitefish range is generally characterized by this thin, shallow, um, weak snowpack structure. And... This is kind of what you see generally, in, um, you know, if you were to dig a hole to the ground is we're seeing the upper, mid to upper snowpack is looking pretty good. Uh, this was dug um, beginning of March. And so we're seeing a, a few feet of snow sitting on a really weak structure. We got facets around crusts um, and two different crusts for that matter. And then at the ground, we got this really poor foundation. And if you're to look at these grains at the ground um, on a cart or look at them through a, a little microscope, um, you'd notice that there's all these little lines. These are striations and they're cupped, um, just impressively weak grains. And, and call these like these are the mother of all weak layers. This is depth horn. And, and this is, uh, you know, these grains get um, yeah worse as you travel farther north. It's just a, a weaker snowpack structure. Uh, however, it's gone through periods of dormancy where we haven't had avalanches um, fail on some of these weak layers. And, and for this one in particular, we'll look at a slide here in a minute, but we had went through almost two months with no reported avalanches on this layer. Um, so, uh, yeah, looking at that avalanche, um, initially this was, you know, this was reported in the beginning of March um, by a snowmobiler. This is Green Mountain in the Ten Lakes area. And initially, we're thinking it failed on the January facet layer, where we got up to the crown and, and dug down, and the ground was <clears throat> right at our feet. So this failed full depth and took out the whole season snowpack. <clears throat> and 
um, like I mentioned, that was almost two months after the last reported avalanche. So it really just goes to show the untrustworthiness of that weak layer. And, um, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's been, it's been fairly tricky to try to forecast, uh, being that we've gone through a really long time without it, without, uh, any activity on it. And then all of a sudden we're starting to see, see a little bit, I suspect, you know, don't know for sure, but I'd venture to guess it was probably this upper track that triggered this. And when we look closer, um, when we got to the crown, this is where that upper sled track was in the top of the crown. And, and this was the thinnest spot in the slab. There's only about a foot of snow here and sitting on just really weak snow. And this is kind of a trademark um, location where you can trigger one of these big avalanches is in this or in these thin spots. And unfortunately, is most of the time you can't really identify where these thin spots are. Some subtle cues of where things are scoured and where you may see rocks sticking out of snow. Those are, are good things to pay attention to, but it's just a hard a hard tactic to utilize to avoid those thin spots at times um, because sometimes it's you can't you can't identify them and they're just it's just um, you know there's rocks and thin spots just under the surface. Um, but this was uh yeah kind of a good a good example of the untrustworthiness of of our structure uh <clears throat> we're sitting right now with this structure it's, you know again we're we've had very few reported avalanches um failing on these persistent weak layers uh and especially since the end of february so we're sitting at unlikely um to be triggered but again if you hit the sweet spot like one of these thin locations it's it's not impossible by no means so moving into the the flathead range, um, you know, it's a little bit deeper of a snowpack there, but it's still um, we still have some areas of concern down at the the bottom of the snowpack, and and the main thing that the main culprit of a lot of our avalanche activity has been this um, faceted crust that formed uh, the closest one of the surfaces is mid January crust, and then a little bit further down is the Christmas crust, and we've got really weak sugary snow that has formed around those crusts uh and yeah if you traveled in the flat range at the end of february you're bound to see some really cool wide avalanches that that failed during our last atmospheric river event um since then we haven't we haven't gotten a lot of activity and the signs of instability aren't glaring but one thing that sticks out to me is this this avalanche here is on nyack mountain and this failed after uh, a relatively light loading event. We got about a foot of snow with some moderate winds and um, not a huge loading event. And it triggered this avalanche here. And something to note, this propagated 1,500 feet wide. The crown was about five feet deep and it traveled a lineal mile. And in its path, it triggered five other avalanches at mid elevation. So really impressive avalanche. and um without a huge loading event so you know some things with with the flag range that we're kind of picking up on is you know snow pit tests are showing us kind of signs that it's hard to trigger but um if triggered uh there's a kind of a high propagation propensity so it can yeah it can definitely propagate and this avalanche here is supporting that that um yeah if you hit the sweet spot these things can break pretty really wide distances and be pretty dangerous avalanches here's a uh picture of a, a the avalanche that failed at mid elevations um so again for, you know fairly wide crown given the path that it that it failed in um again right now since the loading event re recent avalanche activity we suspect that it's um unlikely to trigger uh but the consequences are are pretty high or are high uh, of course, there's a snow pit profile here. Um, so uh, a lot of information here, but just if you focus your eyes inside this box, there's a few things that are, are important to highlight, I think. This would be looking if you're like looking horizontally through the snowpack. And one thing we're identifying in these snow pits is where there's large steps and hardness. So on this side over here, we have hard, um, like it's um, pretty dense snow. And over here, it's weaker snow. So we have a few steps in the... In, um, in these different layers, but then you get down um, around these crusts, the January Christmas crust, and there's really weak snow that's just highlighted in these snow pits. Um, and this is where the main avalanche activity has failed on. 
Um, however, we still have a poor foundation in the flathead range. And this little symbol here is depth hoar. Um, <clears throat> and we're, <coughs> we're predominantly finding this is on southerly and westerly um, aspects that are more exposed to, to wind. And, and we got a, a north wind event early in the season that, that scoured a lot of these southern aspects. So it's just a, a weak snowpack structure. Um, or sitting on a fairly poor foundation that, yeah, hasn't spoken to us um, a lot lately. But uh, what's interesting, and I added this next slide in here, is because since I gave this talk, um, hold on, my, my slides got uh, a little messed up here. I'm gonna bump forward. So since I gave that, um, gave this talk, uh we had an, this avalanche fail in the uh this is in glacier national park and this was on march 16th and this avalanche failed and broke at the failed at the ground so again two months or over two months since we've had a reported avalanche on that layer and now we're starting to get more activity on it so again just showing the untrustworthiness of uh of those grains down at the base of the snowpack so sorry for the little bump around there, but we'll now move into the Swan Range. Uh, for the Swan Range, we really turned a corner in in February, I'd say, is we had a persistent slab problem. We don't the the crust facet combination isn't as bad in the Swan Range, uh, but we did have a layer of surface hoar that produced avalanches that were kind of <clears throat> you know kind of the common theme with this weak layer is they're failing. Areas sheltered from the wind on sheltered as um, you know, those sheltered aspects protected from the sun. And uh, the last reported avalanche that we suspect failed on it was on February 10th. And we didn't get to the crown, but again, we kind of figure based on crown depth that it was that it was this um, week later that was the culprit. Right now, um, the last snow pit we dug, it was really showing good signs. It's been a long time since the last reported avalanche on it. And, you know, these are the grains here. Um, this was taken in the beginning of March of this, these surface hoar grains. So they're, they still exist in the snowpack, um, but snow pit tests are showing them uh, unreactive and our recent avalanche history is, uh, you know, we're pretty far ways out from, from avalanche activity on it. Not saying it's impossible, um, but a lot of things are pointing that it's, that it's healing. So generally in the Swan, we've gotten a lot more snow. Um, the snowpack's looking generally a little bit better. There was a weak layer that was born or born uh, buried in the beginning of March. Um, so far, we're not. It's not shown to be a problem. Not a lot of snows landed on it, um, but it's something that is under the surface and uh, trying to get trying to get some more info on it. Here's a um, a few <laughs> graphics to support where this avalanche activity has been focus to and where the signs of instabilities have also been focused to. So on this side, these yellow dots, um, this is the signs of instability that have been reported through public and private uh, or public and forecaster observations. And you can notice in the flathead and in the whitefish range, a lot of that's focused to easterly aspects at middle elevations. Um, if you move over to and look at <clears throat> Avalanche activity, this is the same thing reported by public and forecaster observations since um, both these are since February 19th. And a lot of the activity that we suspect fail on persistent weak layers has all occurred on northwest to southeast aspects above 5,000 feet in elevation. And the whitefish range is a little bit more confined to upper elevations, and that's where that structure is also poorer. Um, so not saying the the weak layer, especially the facet crust um, combo and and depth work for that matter, it exists on all aspects. Uh, but this is just where the avalanches have been happening, uh, or where the reported avalanches have been happening, I should say. So yeah, there was uh, sorry for the slide mix up. That's a recent avalanche that failed in Glacier National Park. Um, so. <coughs> excuse me, what's ahead? You know, right now we're in a slow transition to spring. Our persistent slab structure um, and snowpack structure, it's, you know, with solar radiation and warming temperatures, it is, you know, it's not a loading event, but uh, 
it is also um it's making us wary of removing the problem i should say because with with solar input and warming um there's a lot of factors that can also increase the likelihood of of these av of this uh these kind of avalanches so we're in a little bit of a holding pattern with our persistent slab problem right now um but further ahead, you know, this is something that uh, keeps kind of, I keep thinking of this happened two years ago and we had a, that year we had a faceted cross that formed in January and this avalanche here failed in <clears throat> um, mid March after multiple nights of no refreeze so warm temperatures and intense solar radiation and uh, really uh, impressive avalanche. It ran a really long distance. Um, the day prior, we saw a lot of avalanche activity in the whitefish range. So, um, you know, we're moving into the time where, where the sun is getting warm and temperatures are also getting warmer too. And this is kind of going back to the, uh, also kind of looks at, you know, these slopes that are getting hit by the most sun are also ones that have a really weak foundation. And uh, looking at our season history, this was taken on November 14th, and this is a south aspect. And what we're noticing here is a lot of the upper elevation southern start zones were stripped because um, our, our first snowfall of the year in November was preceded by strong north and east winds. So that transported snow from the southerly aspects on the northerly aspects and uh, created a really shallow snowpack that sat around for a long period of time. and, and uh, got really weak. So as we get um, sun and, and warm temperatures, these are some of the slopes I'm trying to, they're paying a lot of attention to. Uh, the other thing that, um, you know, it's really interesting this year, we have a lot of glide cracks that have opened up mid-season. And uh, <clears throat> so far, we've had a few reported avalanches, uh, glide avalanches, that failed during times where we had solar input and not real warm temperatures. So um, this one failed on uh, the western, the west side of the Swan and near Peters Ridge. And so, yeah, we start to see nights of no refreeze or rain um, and this intense solar radiations. Yeah, we might start to see these uh, big glide avalanches. And with these avalanches, really the main, all we can do is avoid these. These can fail spontaneously. Of course they fail um, during warming events, but uh, easy to manage, just, just stay out from underneath them is really the only tactic for that. Um, so yeah, moving forward, we're kind of in the slow transition to spring. We have, we've been in a diurnal, so really cold nights, um, warm days. And so it's, uh, we haven't gotten a lot of wet activity yet, uh, but a few things that, just be keep an eye on our, our overnight temperatures if they're staying above freezing. Um, and, you know, if they are, if they're, if overnight temperatures are below freezing, then, you, you know, you got a, a decent window in the morning to get up in a train while it's still refrozen and then try and capitalize as soon as it softens. But, um, you know, can produce some really good riding, but to get out before uh, things warm up and uh, cross that those crusts or surface crusts uh begin to break down so um yeah kind of kind of we got an interesting snowpack um it has a it has the ability to produce some really big avalanches with the poor structure uh just looking ahead it'll be really dependent on how we transition into this warmer weather so that's it for the state of the snowpack. Um, that whole presentation that we did the other night, which also includes uh, a few near misses and incidents that happened throughout the year, that'll get posted pretty soon on the website here. So you can watch that original one as well. Um, but that is all for today. And um, yeah, hope you all have a, a good transition into spring and enjoying some sunshine.